Well, this morning uh, we're going to continue uh, walking our way through the book of Acts. We're not going to probably look at every single chapter in the book of Acts, uh, but, but we're going we're gonna to take a good look at the book of Acts and the meaning of the book of Acts and the purpose of Acts. If you remember, if you were here last week, what we talked about is the book of Acts is God's sequel to all of the Gospels. You remember, the four Gospels are the foundation for our faith. It tells us the story of Jesus, our Savior, how he came from heaven, he, he descended from heaven, he was born a virgin, and he lived a perfect life, and the Gospels tell us that he willingly sacrificed his life for ours, that he died on a cross for our sins, and by doing that, he paid the punishment that, that we as sinners uh, owe to God. God, through Christ, Christ died on the cross for us, and then, miraculously, he was buried in the grave for three days, he rose again on the third day, and miraculously, proclaimed himself to be the Son of God. He is the Son of God, and the resurrection proves that. So that was, that's the basis for our faith, the Gospels. But then God, the story didn't stop there. The Gospels are, are the basis, but now the sequel to that, like a good movie like Rocky or Star Wars or something like that, God had a sequel, and that sequel is the book of Acts. And it tells us how God began to take the story, the truth about his son Jesus, and begin to spread it across the globe, starting in Jerusalem, which is what we're going to see this morning in, in Acts chapter 2. We're going to see one of the most historic events in all of history, how God began to spread his gospel through, uh, throughout the world, beginning in Jerusalem, then to Judea, Samaria, and ultimately to the uttermost parts of the world, like places like Hobbes, New Mexico. Okay? But I like the, the, the title. The title is called Action because the book itself is a story of action. There's never a moment in this book where things are calm. I mean, it's just moving. There's just movement. There's just action throughout the whole book of Acts. And, and it's the story of the Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity. Now, he is the promised one. Jesus said that I must go away. And, and I must go away so that when I go... God the Father will send the Holy Spirit. And you see, it is the Holy Spirit who is at work in the world today, going forth, sharing the gospel, convicting people of their need for Jesus and the eternal life, the good news that Jesus saves those who will place their faith in Him. But I want you to, I want you to think about this just for a second. Where were you? You remember Diana? How many of y'all remember Diana? You can, you can relate to that image. The, remember when Diana was married? It was 1981. Some of y'all might not have even been born yet. But, but, but many of us remember the day when Diana was born. Did you know, if you were to sit and take a wild guess, how many people viewed her wedding? 750 million people. Can you imagine that? At the time, there was less than 5 billion people on the earth. One-fifth of the world almost stopped where they were and tuned in to see. I, I, the, I forget, what, she Princess of Wales. I don't remember what her title is. But anyway, she became ultimately um, Princess Diana, married to, to uh, Charles. Now, you know, history is full of great, meaningful, joyful events. But then there are those moments in history, not so happy. Where were you on 9-11? I can remember exactly where I was on 9-11. How many of y'all remember where you were? Look at that. Look at that. History recorded an event that drastically changed the course of our nation, right? Right? I'm sure there were millions upon millions of people who saw that event. I can remember literally being in a uh, training classroom at State Farm Insurance in Dallas, Texas, and everyone throughout the building said, turn on the TV, let's see what's going on. And, of course, we turn on the TV, and the next thing you know is you see, we literally watched as that second plane flew into that second tower. You know, History is full of major events. But there are very few events as significant as the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost is when God miraculously sent the Holy Spirit of God to begin 
the ministry of spreading the church to the world. Now, more than likely, there were probably, probably less than 5,000 people who really witnessed that event. So there were hundreds of millions of people who witnessed Princess Diana get married. There were hundreds of millions of people who witnessed the planes fly into the tower, in New, the tower, the Twin Towers in New York. There was a big crowd. Don't, don't, don't be surprised. I mean, there was a large crowd who witnessed Pentecost. But nothing compared to what the world is used to seeing on live television today. And yet, that makes it no less significant. You see, the day of Pentecost is one of the most important days in all of human history. Because on that day, God started the movement called the church. And you and I are a result of that. 2,000 years later, we are the church being spread to the uttermost parts of the world. In every corner, every place in the world the gospel is going forth and we talked about that last week we talked about how last last week we talked about over two billion people in the world today claim to be christians they 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 believe that jesus christ is the son of god the doctrine that they hold to uh, says that he is the risen savior and that only in him can someone find eternal life we are the largest body of religious people in the world. Imagine that. And it started, it started on the day of Pentecost. What I want to do this morning is I want to just tell you the story of Pentecost. There's a lot to it. It's a long chapter. It's probably too long for us to just literally read through. I'm just going to tell you the story. I'm going to hit the highlights, if you will, of the, the history uh, of what happened on the day of Pentecost. There's three things, though. I don't want you to get lost in the story. Let me tell you basically how the story breaks down. It's three things. First of all, there is the supernatural event itself. The Holy Spirit comes upon a body of people located in Jerusalem. There's this supernatural event that occurs. And then Peter, kind of the, the, the leader of that band of believers, that band of disciples, he stands up and he explains the supernatural event. So we have the supernatural event itself. Then Peter explains what just happened, basically, in this supernatural event. And then we see the results of that event occurring. What was the result of God, the Spirit of God, the living God coming down and, and, and uh, being there on the day of Pentecost? So let me begin by telling you the kind of initially what happened. The scripture tells us this, that on the day of Pentecost, when it had come, they were all together. A lot of the believers who had witnessed Jesus die, they witnessed him uh, be buried, they witnessed him rise from the dead, uh, he, he had said, wait until the Spirit comes upon you and you will be baptized in power. Well, that day has come. It says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, possibly in the temple, maybe in a large home. And then suddenly it says that from heaven, a noise like a violent rushing wind came in and it filled the whole house as they were sitting there. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of these individuals. It could have rested on all 120 of the disciples or just the 12 themselves. But it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now let me tell you what, uh, basically what all of these people, people who had been believers in Christ, who had witnessed him die and rise from the dead, suddenly on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit of God descends upon them and he begins to, 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 to land upon them. It says that with tongues of fire, they were filled with the ability to speak. Now the word there literally is glossé and it's, it's language. They were given the gift, supernatural gift, to speak in other languages. Now, they're, they're in the presence of many other people who are gathered in the area in Jerusalem to worship on the day of Pentecost. And it created such a roar, such a noise, that it, draw, it drew a lot of people to come watch and see what was going on. I mean, if you were, like, say, in this building and suddenly an explosion went off across the street, we would all turn our attention to that building. And we'd be like, what just happened? 
You know, what, what's going on? Well, that's what happened. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit of God shows up, and he begins to, 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 with a loud presence and a loud noise, and people gather together from all over the town, all over the city, to come. Happening, And then what they see and what they witness are Galileans. Galileans, uneducated men, who are speaking miraculously in all kinds of languages from all over the world. The uttermost parts of the world. Now, imagine for a minute that I was standing here today and suddenly the Holy Spirit of God came upon me and he gave me the ability to suddenly speak in French. I don't know French. Okay, I have no idea how to speak French. I don't know, I, I maybe know a few words in Spanish, okay? I, I'm just, you know, I'm not that good at languages. But suddenly I can speak in French, or maybe I can speak in some African dialect, or some German dialect, or something like that. God supernaturally gave these men the ability to speak in all of the various dialects where people had gathered from all over the world to worship in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And all of a sudden, these people go, what is going on? Now, this guy is from Galilee. It's not likely that he knows how to speak Par Parthenian or Cretan or whatever language is that these people are gathered from. So it's a supernatural event. It's a supernatural experience. And then what happens is, is that Peter stands up to explain to them what they are witnessing. It's the sermon, essentially, that is heard around the world. Peter stood up, he took his stand with the eleven, and he raised his voice and declared to them. He said, men of Judea and all of you in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, because they were speaking in different dialects. He reminds them that it's only 9 a.m. in the morning. They haven't been drinking, they haven't had too much to drink. Peter says that this supernatural event that you are witnessing is exactly what was prophesied in the book of Joel. It says, but this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. Men of Israel, listen. Men of Israel, listen to me, these words. Now, turn with me over to uh, Acts chapter 2 because I want to show you this quickly. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 17. And Peter says... That what you are witnessing is literally the fulfillment of a prophecy that God had prophesied many, many years ago in the book of Joel to the prophet Joel. He said, and it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit on all of mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall visions and your old men shall dream dreams even on my bond slaves both men and women I will pour on on them in those days forth my spirit and they shall prophesy and I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below blood and fire and vapor and smoke the sun will be darkened and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come and it shall be that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved Peter says, look guys, what you just saw, what you just witnessed was not just some commonplace thing where a bunch of guys were sitting around drunk or drinking and all of a sudden they got drunk and started being silly and saying a bunch of stupid words. No, this was a supernatural event where literally the God of the universe sends his Holy Spirit and he gifts these people to speak in specific languages. Now what are they speaking? Well, of course, they're speaking about what has just happened in Jerusalem in the last 50 days. How Jesus, the Messiah, was crucified at the hands of the, the leaders of Israel and how he was buried and then miraculously he was raised from the dead. They are all speaking to all of these different groups. So I'm over and I'm speaking to Parthenians over here, speaking to them in their language, but I'm telling the truth about what has happened in Jerusalem recently and how Jesus died and rose again and over here I'm speaking to the to the Cretans and over here I'm speaking to the Macedonians and over here I'm speaking you see what I'm saying so God miraculously allowed his disciples men who had followed Christ closely during his lifetime to speak suddenly the truth of what God has done in history you see this is one of the greatest days in all of human history Pentecost Pentecost has come God has begun to send his message out to the whole world that he loves every single human being in this world. And he wants every single human being, no matter whether you're a Parthenian 
or a Mede or a Cretan or whatever, or you're an American or an African or a French person or whatever, God's message is this, that he loves you and he sent his son to die for you. And today is the beginning of something incredibly special and incredibly supernatural. You see, Peter goes on to say, he says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. He begins to testify himself to them. He says, Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God clearly performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. So he's speaking to a, a large crowd of people. He says, look, all you people who have been here in Jerusalem for a long time and here in Judea and Samaria, you know what Jesus did. You saw with your very eyes all of these signs and, and miracles and, and all these things that he did. And you know it to be true. You were eyewitnesses. He said, this man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed him to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Now this verse, this next verse. Man, this is a Hall of Fame verse right here. I mean, this verse ought to just grab you from your head down to your toes. He said, but God, God raised him up again, putting an end to the, glory, uh, to the agony of death. Look at this. Since it was impossible for him to be held in his power. So Peter takes a moment in time and he says, Watch, people. God has supernaturally blessed everyone here so that we can begin to tell the story of Jesus and how he died for our sins and rose again and defeated death because it was impossible it was impossible for death to hold him down now pardon me for just a second but just give you an illustration of this if I could pick any day in history where where I would be able to be present and actually see it and and view it I would pick the resurrection morning I would pick the resurrection morning because on that morning, Jesus did something that no one in all of the history could ever do. He defeated death. You see, he was dead, and yet he came to life. And he came to life to show that he is the Son of God, that he alone possesses the power to overcome sin and death. Now, if, if I was on the sidelines and I was watching the morning of the resurrection, you know what it would be like for me? You know when those football coaches are on the sideline and they're watching the clock tick down? And, and they're waiting, and, and the moment that that clock finishes, they're the coach of the team that won the national championship. Or they're the coach of the team that won the Super Bowl. And you know what, you know what happens next? What happens next? Every time, every time that clock ticks to zero, somebody from the crowd takes a big bucket of Gatorade and throws it on the coach. Now, just go with me for a second, okay? If I could have been there on Red morning, I would have had a big bucket of Gatorade and I would have dumped it on Jesus. I'd be like, way to go, Jesus! You just won, man! You won the Super Bowl. But that's the meaning of that verse. Do you see that? You see... That verse really essentially contains everything we need to know about the book of Acts because it is the, the truth about the resurrection that drives the entire book of Acts. We win. We are the victor. We get the bucket of Gatorade. We just won the Super Bowl. It is impossible, Peter says, impossible for death to hold him in his power. Now, what was the result of that? If you're a first century person and you're there in Jerusalem and you're witnessing this supernatural event where you see all of these men beginning to speak in foreign tongues that you know they're unable to do normally, you have to know that it's a miracle. You know that it's a miracle. And so you're witnessing this. And then Peter stands up and he explains what the meaning of that supernatural event is. And he says, here's the, here's the message, guys. You missed it. You messed up. You see, you crucified the Son of Glory. And they're like, oh my gosh. The conviction falls. 
The conviction falls. Suddenly you are face to face. You are a person, a leader in Jerusalem. And suddenly you realize, oops, I made a big, big mistake. And their answer is, Peter, what do we do? What do we do? Look at what he says. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You made a big mistake, guys. You crucified the Lord of glory. And they're like, "Uh uh-oh, that's not good. What am I going to do? And Peter says, Repent. What does he mean when he says repent? You see, they had to change their mind. They came face to face with the mistake they had made, and they made a 180. They said, I'm going this direction. I thought Jesus Christ, this man who did these things among us, I thought he was a criminal. I thought he opposed the law of Moses. That's why I sentenced him to death. That's why I crucified him. And I was right in doing that. I can stand on everything that I believe and tell you that I made the right decision. And all of a sudden you go, "Uh uh-oh. I made the wrong decision. What do I do? I repent. I'm headed this way. I believe he was a criminal, and now I know he was the son of God and the son of glory. And I turn, and I say, oh, my gosh, I've got to fix the error. I've got to fix the mistake that I made. I repent, and I turn to him in faith. That's what you and I must do when we come face to face with the truth about Christ and who he is. We look and we say, He's, he's not worth my time. I don't believe in him. I don't think he's the son of God. I don't think he's who he says he is. And then all of a sudden you come face to face with him and you go, uh-oh, I made a big mistake and I repent. I turn from that and I turn to him in faith. I turn to him in faith. And what does he do? He says he will forgive you of your sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit. At that moment in time, history changed forever. History changed forever. Because that moment in time, the church of God was born in Jerusalem. And it goes forth today. We are a product of what happened on the day of Pentecost. We are the reason, or the reason we are here is because of Pentecost. You see, somebody somewhere along the line, maybe it was your mom, maybe it was your dad, Maybe it was a friend, a co-worker. Somebody told you about Jesus. Somebody told you that you need forgiveness of your sins. Somebody told you that your broken life can be fixed if you will trust in Christ as your Savior and give your life to Him. And that's why you're here today. You're here today because somebody 2,000 years ago got saved and then they told someone else and they got saved and they told someone else and they got saved and it went on and on and on and on. And 2,000 years ago, we are sitting here today in Hobbs, New Mexico talking about something that happened that was supernatural and continues to happen today. God is still at work in human history taking the message to the world I want to show you. So we talked about the supernatural event. Peter's explanation of that supernatural event. And now I want you to see the result of that event. Look at what happened. After they were convicted and they gave their heart to Christ, they trusted in Jesus, what happened? It says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. That continues today. That continues today. You see, immediately following their lives being changed and them receiving Christ as their Savior, they began to gather as a church. It says that over 3,000 people were saved on that day. It was like a big Billy Graham, you know, big Billy Graham deal or whatever. A lot of people got saved. They repented and they believed on Christ. And then they formed the church, and to this day, we are still doing that very thing. We are devoting ourselves to the teaching of the Word, to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread and prayer. That's essentially what a church is. That's essentially what we do. Matter of fact, we're going to do that today. 
it's significant that that verse speaks to what we're going to do shortly here in just a minute. We're going to take the Lord's Supper. We're going to share. We're going to break bread together. And we're going to fellowship together in remembrance of what He has done for us. Now, I want to challenge you with something. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Not a single one of us in here is good enough to take the gospel to the world. Not, not one of us has, has the ability on our own to do that. It has to be the power of the Holy Spirit moving in your life and my life that leads us out to share the truth about Christ. And He wants us to do that. He tells us to go into the world and to make disciples, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Baptizing Him in the name of the, ho- the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're called to go and make disciples. One of us is qualified to do that. We're only able to do that when God, through His Spirit, qualifies us and, and, and permits us to move forward. You see, last week we looked at how we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that on the day of Pentecost, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You will be empowered by the third person of the Trinity to go forth and do that. It is only by that power that we can do that. And I want you to think about this. When you think about taking the gospel to your friends or your neighbors or your loved ones, that Jacob was a cheater. Did you know that? Remember the story about Jacob, how he was a cheater. He was always deceiving people. He wasn't worthy to be considered a member of the family of God. Peter had a terrible temper. David had an affair. Noah got drunk. Jonah ran from God. Paul was a murderer. He was a murderer. And yet God qualified him. He was not qualified, but God, by His grace, forgave him and then qualified him to go forth. Martha was, many of y'all are warriors. Sarah was impatient, and Lazarus was dead. But God qualified them to take the message of the gospel. What's your excuse? What reason are you giving? What, what, What thing are you holding on to that says you're not qualified to take the gospel forward? Well, it may very well be that that's holding you back. But you know what? God will forgive you. God will give you grace. And He will still send you out because you are not qualified to do it on your own. It is only when He qualifies you to go forth that you can do it. 2,000 years later, He is calling us to do that. Will you do that? Don't give him an excuse like Moses and say, well, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm not a good speaker. I can't, I can't talk well. I stutter or whatever. He'd, he'd say, I don't care about that. I'm telling you to go. I'm telling you to share the love of Christ with your friends or your neighbors. You know, last week I asked you to think about two people, just two people, that you would commit to pray for this year and pray for them on a regular basis, on a daily or a weekly basis. Lord, God, this person, I'm certain they don't know Christ. I want them to know Christ. Lord, I'm praying. I'm bringing them before your throne. I'm asking you, Lord, please save their soul. Let your spirit work on them. Draw them to you. God, give me the courage. Give me the spiritual courage to share the message of how Jesus loves him or her. We can do that. Now, I want to share, in closing, I want to share this story with you. Have you ever heard the story of the coffee bean? The Coffee Bean. This is a recent book that was written. It's a Wall Street Journal bestseller. It's called The Coffee Bean. Now, let me tell you the story of The Coffee Bean. Um, How many of y'all know Dabo Sweeney? Dabo Sweeney is the coach for the Clemson Tigers. They played against the uh, LSU, or uh, uh, is that right? No, uh, Clemson is, I forget, Clemson Tigers? So it was the Tigers against the Tigers. Well, there you go. Okay. (laughs) LSU playing for the national championship, played Dabo Sweeney's team, the Clemson Tigers, okay? But Dabo Sweeney is a big proponent of this book. And the message is a great message. And here's the message. He said, one time he met this young man, and he was really discouraged and down. He was trying to work through some problems in his life. And he was told this story that he passed on to him. He said, son... Do you know the story of the coffee bean? He said, no, I've never heard that, coach. He said, well, let me tell you. Let me tell you the story. 
He said, what happens to a carrot, just a big old carrot, when you stick it in hot water? What happens to it? It gets soft. That's right. Somebody said that. It gets soft. If you stick it in water, it gets soft. It's affected by the, by the water. The water affects the carrot. You see, the water makes the carrot soft, makes it mushy. I hate mushy carrots. Sorry. He said, what about this? What happens to an egg if you stick it in water? He said, well, the, 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 son, the, the young man knew the answer to that. He said, well, it gets hard boiled. It gets hard. The water affects the egg, makes it hard boiled. He said, that's kind of what life is like. You know, you got, you got all these outside forces, maybe some internal things going inside of you. And those forces will either make you soft and ineffective or hardened against the events. He said, but what about the coffee bean? He goes, well, I don't know. If you stick a coffee bean in water, what happens? You know what happens? It makes coffee. It permeates the water. You see, the water essentially affects the coffee bean, but then the coffee bean affects the water. You see the difference? The first two are affected but make no change on the water. The third one is affected by the water, but then it affects the water. Here's the point. You and I can be a carrot, an egg, or a coffee bean. Maybe the things that go on in this world, maybe they bully you to the point where you get soft and mushy and you just kind of turn away. You're just, you just, you know, I'm not going to try to impact it. I'm just going to kind of turn away from it. I'm going to get soft. I'm going to let everything bully me and affect me. Or maybe you're like the egg. You know, the hard times and the difficult things in the world, they come in and they make you hard and they harden you. They harden your heart. You get hard against it. Or you can be like the coffee bean. And you can permeate the water. You can affect those around you. You see, that's the gospel. That's the gospel. We walk around with the greatest message in all of human history. We walk around with the words of eternal life. And we have a choice. We can let events and things happen in our life that make us turn away from sharing that message. Or we can humbly take that message and like a coffee bean... We can spread the good news. I want us to be like a coffee bean. I want our church to be a big old coffee bean or a whole jar full of coffee beans. That we would affect those around us. That we would permeate with time when people interact with us and they're around us. That they would see a difference and their lives would be impacted by our love and our reflection of Christ. We need to be a coffee bean this morning, I want to challenge you to recognize that this event that happened 2,000 years ago was truly one of the most historic events in all of history. But it is our job to carry it on, to carry it on, to carry the truth of what happened at Pentecost on in our world today, 2,000 years ago, uh, now, later, here in Hobbs, New Mexico. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this incredible true story of how you began the movement of the church 2,000 years ago and that that message and that movement still continues today. And you've given each of us individually the responsibility to take that message to our friends and our neighbors, our loved ones, our relatives. God, I pray that we would be like a coffee bean. Make this church a coffee bean. Let us affect and impact those around us. I pray in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.